Welcome to EPG Padshala. This is Professor Sirimavu Nair, Department of Foods and Nutrition, Faculty of Family and Community Sciences, MS University of Vadodara. In the last unit, we had learned about fluid medium existing in our body. Today, we will talk about the transport system. So, let us look into the transportation of various molecules across membranes. This unit has two parts, intra and extracellular transport. In the introduction, we would see how the system functions. Body has an open system, takes in quite a large number of particles as solids and liquids. Some of them are in the form of major proteins rather micro or macromolecules. To maintain the balance between intake and output, the body needs to readjust all the particle concentrations after completion of its metabolic activities. Thus, it maintains principles of homeostasis. In simple words, the total amount of substance in the body equals to the intake plus production minus the excretion minus the metabolism. Water and nutrients all forms enter into the system as food and is absorbed through intestine. Gaseous exchange happens through lungs while volatile and lipid based molecules pass through barriers of membranes. Further, it is compartmentalized as external and internal compartments. There is always an equilibrium maintained in the compartment. However, movement of nutrients, ions, etc. are in constant movement between the body and its compartments. These movements are due to transport mechanisms which are named as active and passive transport. With the objective here, the learner will be able to comprehend the working mechanism of active and passive transport. They would be able to relate with the interaction of nutrients which can influence the channel activities. Active transport process requires high amount of energy. This comes from ATP molecules. The passive transport occurs due to bulk flow of liquids from one area to the other. During such a flow, the particles move across more than one membrane and causes a change in the pressure gradient. The best example is movement of blood flow. Due to the high intense pressure of the heart, the RBCs which are suspended in the plasma will flow across. In passive transport, the, though there will be no hindrance, the cell membrane can selectively act as semi permeable barrier. Majorly here, the size of the molecule and its solubility can influence the movement. The best example is membrane passive transport. The passive transport involves diffusion as a major process. Diffusion has following properties. Molecules travel from higher area to lower area of concentration. Majorly, this is difference in concentration termed as chemical gradient. Also, the molecules keep moving across till they reach at equilibrium. Diffusion slows down as distance increases. Temperature has an effect on the process more than heat better than diffusion. Some of the molecules dissolve in the lipid mediums faster. According to Fick's law of diffusion, rate of diffusion of a surface area multiplied by concentration gradient multiplied by membrane permeability is the membrane thickness. 
The following figures ex explain this. In most physiological cases, the membrane thickness is constant. Hence, diffusion rate would be concentration gradient multiplied by membrane permeability into the surface area. Thus, it can be stated that when concentration of particles become equal on both sides of a membrane, transport stops. Therefore, it attains equilibrium. The process remains similar in case of facilitated diffusion also. The second one is osmosis. As observed earlier, while diffusion renders equilibrium by particle movement, water gets removed across its concentration gradient. In the solution, when the molecules are too large, then they cannot pass through the membrane pores. Therefore, pressure would be exerted to move the solutes. This force is named as osmotic pressure. The best example is mixing of sugar in coffee or tea. We can see here the video which shows this. Two solutions of sugar is separated by a semi-permeable membrane where the membrane is too small to permeate the sugar. One side it has high concentration of sugar twice the amount of the other. After few minutes, you can see the concentration of sugar will be equal on both sides. This is due to the fact that osmotic pressure across the membrane pulls the water from the dilute area into the higher concentration area or we can say water has moved down against the concentration gradient. This phenomenon progresses till equilibrium reaches the solution becomes isotonic. Here in the RBC cell, we can see the physiological mediums and its effects pertaining to hypo, hyper and isotonic mediums. Plasma osmolarity changes due to plasma water concentration. It becomes more dilute when compared to intracellular fluids within a cell. As a result, water will move down its concentration gradient across membranes. Plasma becomes hypotonic. Vice versa happens when plasma becomes more concentrated with hypertonic. For an RBC, 0.9% sodium chloride solution which is normal physiological saline is isotonic. The RBC membrane behaves as an impermeable medium to sodium and chloride ions and the solutes. When in the normal medium, the solution bathes the RBC. Here, water molecules enter and exit at the same rate. As a result, the RBC will be able to retain the shape, size and the volume. In hypotonic medium, water will enter faster into the compartments than they leave. The RBCs swell and burst resulting in hemolysis. In an hypotonic medium, 2% sodium chloride, the water moves out faster than they enter. This causes shrinkage of cells and is known as crenation. These techniques are aroused in the therapeutic approaches where solutions for IV or liquids for IV are infused into the blood. The principle of transfusing fluids is used here. The mixture based would be an isotonic medium of 0.9 percent sodium chloride and dextrose of 5 percent in water. Hypertonic mediums like mannitol relieves fluid overload through osmosis of water from interstitial fluids into the blood. Further, kidneys would excrete the excess water as urine. Hypertonic solutions 
like oral solutions can be used in the treatment of dehydration. On administration of these fluids, water moves from blood to intestinal fluids and then to the body cells to rehydrate them. All these processes occurred without involvement of energy. Now coming to active transport, this transport involves ATP molecules means it involves energy. It can be mediated through structural ports, enzymes, receptors, etc. Here we can subdivide the transport ports into two categories, channel ports which create fluid filled passage and makes extra and intracellular compartments. Carrier ports binds substrates but would not associate with contra or extracellular fields. The figure shows the selectivity of the channel which is determined by the diameter of a central pore by electrical charges of amino acids in the channel. Primary active transport here ATP is the source of energy to push molecules against their concentration gradient. The secondary transport uses potential energy of any one molecule to push the other molecule example sodium potassium ATPase. It is a sodium potassium ATPase pump where the ATPase uses energy from ATP to pump sodium out and potassium into the cell. Now the mechanism of sodium potassium ATPase. This primary active transport has the mechanism with three sodium ions which will move from ICF binds to the inner region of the membrane where ATP is used. ATP is helps and is phosphorylated the protein changes the conformation the three sodium gets released into ICF two potassium ions would bind from ACF two potassium is released into the ICF. The second example is using the mechanism of STLT modes. This is a transport system which uses potential energy stored to move glucose against concentration gradient. The family of glucose transporters help in moving 6 carbon sugars such as glucose, mannose, galactose and fructose across cell membranes. Since they do not transport any unnatural occurring glucose molecule, they are highly specific for only naturally occurring 6 carbon sugars or hexose sugars. First isolation of TLUT was in 1980. Most important ones are GLUT 1 to 5 of these one is formed in most of the cells, second in the liver and kidney, third in the neurons, four insulin regulation in muscular cells and five as intestinal fructose transporter. Sodium binds to the carrier molecule this will create a site for the glucose. The glucose binding changes carrier conformation, sodium is released into the cytosol, glucose follows. Thus we can summarize passive transport does not require energy, the examples are of diffusion and osmosis, active transport uses energy molecules to change the conformation of cells and thereby facilitating the molecules to move in across membranes. Now comes the second part, the vesicular transport. This uses smaller vesicles. This is a process by which bigger molecules 
move into a cell. It is different from phagocytosis in two ways. One, the number of the membrane pushes in a creating a medium which is harrowed space and enlarges to form a vacuole like structure. There is a possibility of pinocytosis to occur along with endocytosis. The process requires ATP molecules. There are two types of endocytosis, one receptor mediated and second is ligand mediated. The receptor mediated the process occurs in coated pits which are coated with a protein known as clathrin. This protein is found in these pits. The following figures would show the receptor mediated endocytosis and exocytosis steps 1 to 4 are illustrating endocytosis and steps 7 to 9 show exocytosis. Segments of cell membranes are withdrawn as vesicles and reinserted during exocytosis in the process is known as membrane recycling. The mechanism of its action is as follows. Extracellular ligands bind into the cell receptor. They form a receptor ligand complex. This complex travels till they find a clathrin molecule. Further, the membrane invaginates. It pinches off from the cell membrane from the top and becomes a small cytoplasmic vesicle. Further, the clathrin is released back. Inside the vesicle, the receptor and the ligand would separate. It leaves the ligand again and the process would continue. This is known as membrane recycling. Now the ligand which are used in endocytosis can be recycled. Here the vesicle moves along with receptors, attaches itself and further fuses with the cell membrane or it can be taken back by exocytosis. The extracellular surface of the cell membrane becomes inside area of the vesicular membrane. The receptor mediated endocytosis helps in transport of hormones, growth factors, antibodies, plasma proteins that can serve as carrier for iron and cholesterol. Few examples are epithelial transport. Epithelial transport is the movement of molecules across an epithelium. There are two types of transport. First, paracellular transport where the transport of molecule is through the junction between the adjacent cells and second is transcellular transport where the transport is through the epithelial cells by themselves. Movement of water or ions and a few small unchanged molecules by the paracellular pathway is facilitated by some junctional proteins. They can be claudins or molecules which form larger holes or pores. Movement of substances by the transcellular pathway involve a combination of active and trans port mechanisms along with passive mechanisms by which they cross two cell membranes. Transepithelial transport of glucose from lumen of kidney tubule and intestine to the extracellular fluids is illustrated in the following figure. Transepithelial transport of glucose the process involves indirect or secondary active transport of glucose across the apical membranes and glucose diffusion across the basolateral membranes. The STLT carrier movement of glucose from the lumen into the epithelial cell is facilitated by this molecule. 
the concentration of glucose is low in the lumen so it utilizes the energy of sodium ions to move into the epithelial cells to maintain gradient concentration the second the glu2 transporter from the basolateral membrane of the epithelial cell and the glucose moves to the ecf by facilitated diffusion from glu2 transporter following its down regulation on the concentration gradient the third is sodium atps movement where removal of sodium from epithelial cell is important and essential to maintain the sodium concentration where the gradient would be there in order to absorb more glucose inside hence the sodium potassium atps pump and the sodium of the cell would use the energy from atp and maintain the sodium concentration low in icf now comes transcytosis molecules that are too large to be moved by the transporters can be transported across the cell by transcytosis it involves three processes endocytosis vesicular transport across the cell and exocytosis these figures show how this happens transcytosis across the capillary endothelium where plasma proteins are concentrated in receptor which is known as cavioli which then undergo endocytosis and forms vesicle these vesicles across the cell help to form cytoskeleton the contents of vesicles are released into the interstitial fluid by exocytosis by this mechanism infants absorb maternal antibodies in the breast milk which is used for developing immunity the cell to cell communication is the second process there are two basic types of physiological signals chemical and electrical most of the communication is through chemical signals different methods for cell to cell communication include the direct cytoplasmic transfer through gap junctions contact depending signaling which are local chemical communication by paracrine signals and autocrine signals long distance communications are by neurocrine molecules example cytokines functions as both the local and long distance signals signal pathways which will involve chemical signals have specific affinity for their receptors present on their target cell binding to these which will initiate a response there are few types of membrane receptors the receptor channel has ligand binding openings and it closes the channel the receptors would have enzymes ligand binding to a receptor enzyme complex activates the intracellular enzyme the g protein coupled receptor where ligand binding to a g protein coupled with the receptor can open an ionic channel or alters the enzyme activity the best example is integrin receptor the ligand binding to the integrin receptors can also alter cytoskeleton signal amplification is an important step in transformation of signals in a cell here the receptor ligand complex activates amplifier enzyme this helps to amplify signals and allow small amount of ligands to create a large effect example adenylyl cyclase guanylyl cyclase and phospholipase c are the most common amplifying enzymes 
JPCR CAMP signal transduction is one example. Many lipophobic hormones use this pathway for signal transduction. Based on the figure, the steps illustrated are in the figure. The J protein coupled adenyl cyclase CAMP system illustrates a signal cascade. Signal molecule binds to J protein linked receptors which activates the coproteins. This in turn activates adenyl cyclase. It is an amplifier enzyme and amplifies the signal. Adenyl cyclase converts ATP to cyclic AMP. The CAMP activates protein kinase A. Protein kinase A phosphorylates other proteins leading ultimately to a cellular response. The GPCR phospholipase system is this next example. The figure explains phospholipase C system. Signal molecule activates the receptor and associated G protein. This in turn activates phospholipase C. Further, this phospholipase C can act as a amplifier enzyme which on binding the G protein coupled receptors convert it into two lipid derived secondary messengers the diacylglycerol DAG and inositol triphosphate IP3. We can see in these figures the phospholipase C system. In the system another G protein coupled secondary messenger which phospholipase C converts membrane lipids into two secondary messengers the DAG and IP3. The DAG activates protein kinase C which phosphorylates proteins and IP3 thus causing the release of calcium ions from organelles creating a calcium channel signal. The novelty of these signal molecules are calcium itself acts as an important signal molecule. It enters the cell either through voltage gated calcium channels or through ligand gated or mechanically gated channels. The calcium ion binds with specific calcium binding proteins called calmodulin and gives different responses in the cell. This figure explains the binding process. Calcium acts as an intracellular messenger. Calcium signal occurs in the cytosol. The calcium enters the cell or it is released from the intercellular sources. Binding of calcium to calmodulin to alter the activity of the enzyme transporter or gating the ionic channels is possible. Calcium binding to regulatory protein alters the movement of contractile and cytoskeletal proteins such as microtubules. Example calcium binding to troponin initiate the muscular contraction in a skeletal muscle. Calcium binding to regulatory proteins triggers exocytosis of secretory vesicles. The release of insulin from pancreatic beta cells is best example. The direct binding of calcium to the ionic channels alters their gate states. Example calcium activated potassium channels of a nerve cell. It can fire the neurons. Initialization of embryo development upon entry of calcium into fertilized egg is another example. Other such important molecules of these natures are nitric oxide, carbon monoxide, hydrogen sulfide and are short lived gaseous signal molecules. Nitrous oxide activates guanylyl cyclase and 
the arachtonic acid cascade creates lipid signal molecules such as leukotrienes, prostaglandins and thromboxanes. All of these operate via calcium channels. Thank you very much for a patient listening.